Thank you, thank you. You may go ahead and have a seat. So I am Steve Smotherman Jr. I know my father has been here several times, Pastor Steve Smotherman Sr. Um, and I uh, was talking to him and I said, you know, I get to travel and I do sports psychology. So I work with a, a lot of different athletes across various sports um, as well as uh, colleges. And I said, I don't really get nervous anywhere, but I was very excited to be here uh, because this is the church uh, with the Barnetts, starting with Pastor Tommy Barnett, who's a hero and a mentor. My dad said he's had three mentors in his life, and Pastor Tommy's one of them, and so I love you and appreciate you, sir. Um, and then Pastor Luke and Angel Barnett uh, have become such very near and dear friends to us. Pastor Luke's actually on our board at our church, so he's got my back. And uh, so I'm excited to be here. I've been here uh, for the conference every year and been at this church so many times, and so uh, it is an honor. Uh, I, I do have one thing before I get going. I didn't bring any books, but I do have a book out called Bring the Juice. Uh, I believe they'll have a QR code up behind me. You can scan it. It's available on Amazon. It's a short, quick read. It's about 120 pages. It's a story that teaches the principles of mental performance. So what I do is teach mental performance. So I'm not exactly the guy uh, that comes in after you have problems. I, I call myself like a probiotic. I'm helping you to avoid the problems. And then when adversity strikes, I give you something that you can go to. Uh, and so that's what I do when I'm working with athletes, teaching them how to breathe, how to, how to stay uh, focused when your nerves are going, your heart's pumping, everything's on the line, how to stay composed and get control of yourself and how to act differently than how you feel. Because, you know, in our society now, it's all about how I feel. The problem with that is I can't really control my feelings. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad. Uh, I don't control my confidence. If I asked you uh, in here, what is confidence? Most of you would say, well, I either feel it or I don't. I argue that it's not a feeling, it's an action. I'm going to act my way into confidence versus waiting for a feeling because the feeling may never come. If you've ever just sat around at home and done nothing and you start to get really sad or the word now is depressed, well, the way to get out of that is to start acting different than how we feel. So I call it emotional management. We can't really control them. Emotions change. I could have been very confident sitting there during worship and I could have walked on this stage and not felt it anymore. But guess what? I've learned how to act different than how I feel. So you're not going to know if I'm confident or not. You're just going to be like, man, he looks like he knows exactly what he's doing. But internally, I could be freaking out, right? Like, but as we grow into maturity, especially in Christ, we learn that our feelings cannot dictate our lives. I don't want my feelings to own me. I have to bring the juice. What bring the juice means is I've got to be an energy giver because the world has enough energy vampires. So I always ask, are you a fountain or a drain? When you walk in, especially as the people of God. Right, we, we can't be the same as everybody else that we work with. They complain, we don't. Because if we complain, then what is there about us that, that should be contagious? Because negative energy and positive energy are both contagious. But the people of God have to understand that sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. We've got to be people that, hey, I don't really like my boss. I don't really like my job, but I'm going to do it as unto the Lord, and I'm going to give it the best effort that I can, regardless of how I feel about it. And you say, but you don't know my boss. Well, I read in the Bible there was King David who had a boss that threw spears at his head. So unless your boss is throwing spears at your head, which if you're in America now, that means you're probably in an illegal job. <laughs> it could happen. But you can figure it out. And you can have a good attitude because God's not gonna be able to elevate us unless we learn to act different than how we feel right where we're at. Why? Because excellence in small things is excellence in all things. Whoever's good with little, he'll give more. So I have a favor to ask of all of you tonight. I need you to give me your very best effort. 
What we, whatever we do tonight, what we talk about, I need you to lock in, give me your very best effort. I know some of you say, hey, preacher, I have a little bit of attention issues. I don't know how to pay attention. So here's what I want you to do real quick. Sit up real straight in your chair, put your hands on your knees, and give me your undivided attention for 30 seconds. Just 30 seconds, pay attention to every single word that's coming out of my mouth. You're listening to me. You're hearing it, right? You heard it. You know you're sitting up. You're, you're, you're super engaged. You know what you just showed me? You don't have an attention problem. We have a focus problem. Most of us just don't want to focus on what we need to focus on, and then we don't get the results that we thought we should get because our focus was wrong. So I need you to give me your very best effort, okay? Yes? Yes. So I'm going to ask you to do something right now. It's going to be something physical. You're like, oh, great. You're going to stay seated. Don't worry. But I'm going to ask you to do something physical, and I need everybody in here and everybody watching online and at Short Creek and White Mountains, you've got to give me your very best effort. Agreed? Agreed. I mean your very best. Okay, so on the count of three, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you can, when I say one, two, three, go, you're going to raise your right hand as high as you can get it. Stay seated, but I want you just to raise it as high as you can get it, okay? One, two, three, go. Get it as high as you can get it, high as you can get it. Okay, give me a quarter inch more, just a quarter inch more. Why did so many of your hands just go up a little bit? Put your hands down real quick. Time out, time out. You told me that you were going to give me your very best. And I asked for a quarter inch more, and a whole lot of y'all had a little bit more in the tank. Not only did you tell me it was your best, but you told yourself that that was your best. See, oftentimes we tell ourselves we've given everything we have to it. God, I've prayed as much as I can. God, I've done as much as I could. But there's always a little bit more. So watch this. Let's do it again. When I count to three, I want you to give me your best effort and put your hand as high as you can get it. If you can't use your right, you can use your left. Ready? One, two, three, go. Now somebody give me six inches more. (laughs) He stood up right there. Y'all put him down. There's another one standing up. Okay. There's always a way. Right? We have to believe, especially as people of God, that when we're connected to Jesus, there's always a way. No matter the adversity, no matter the storm, no matter what it is, we have to have a mental attitude and a disposition about us that says there's always a way. When I see no way, it's a worship song we sing, you are the way. You, there, you make a way. That's who God is. He's the way maker, miracle worker, right? We've got to believe that. And so I'm going to give us tonight four key mindsets. I call them four elite mindsets that when I'm working with athletes, I have them all write these down and, and we work on them. Um, when I'm working with businesses, I've, I've gotten to work with uh, different companies, sales organizations, real estate agents, churches, people. This works in every area of your life if you are willing to adopt these mindsets and practice them. The way that I talk about mental performance, I don't like to give a lot of theory. I like to give practical tools because you've probably heard motivational speakers and you've heard things and you're like, man, theoretically, that's amazing, but what do I do with it, right? And so I like people to practice. I talk about how mental performance is actually a skill set that you can acquire by practicing. It's difficult, So the first one is really gratitude, and the way I say it is to write down and say this to yourself, I'm thankful for the opportunity to do and then fill in the blank. So when you wake up tomorrow and you don't feel like going to work, you wake up and tell yourself, I am thankful for the opportunity to first wake up and second that I can go do something. Because in my doing, if I'm doing it as unto the Lord, I'm bringing glory to God, and there's blessing and favor upon that. Right? If I'm working with golf teams, uh, one of the teams I work with just uh, did really well in the NCAA regionals, so they're actually going to be here next week playing at Greyhawk in the NCAA National Championships, so we had a great day today. I, I work with the University of New Mexico Lobos, so go Lobos. Um, but they, uh, they, they just qualified today, so we had a good day. I actually played golf today and had the best round of my life. I love Phoenix and this church. Uh, I had great mental game uh, today. But I tell them, be thankful that you, you get to play golf. I'm on staff with the, the Ohio State University men's baseball team, and this is what we talk about. I'm thankful that I get to play baseball. 
You say, but they get to play a game. But I'm thankful that I get to go coach. I'm thankful that I get to preach. I'm thankful that I get to walk with people even though it's difficult sometimes. How do I know? Because people are difficult. You know how I know? Because the guy I look at in the mirror every day is very difficult. God, I'm thankful that I get to figure out me today and try to become more like Jesus. But it has to be our, 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 our posture, right? Galatians, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says this, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. But I, I've prayed, keep praying. In everything, notice it doesn't say in some things, in the things we like, in the things we're feeling, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Right, you ever ask that question? I don't know what the will of God is. It's that we would rejoice always that we would give God thanks, that we'd be thankful. God, I'm thankful for this opportunity. Yeah, but, but, but preacher, it's, it's hard. I, I'm not really that thankful for the season that I'm going through. But if we can be thankful through it, on the other side, we're going to grow. We're going to get better. And not only then, we get to now get over some more obstacles, and we get to now learn how to help other people get over obstacles as they go through it. Yeah. Right? You ever gone through something and someone came up to you? You know, God's going to use it. That's the like last thing I ever want to hear when I'm going through some stuff. So it's like, well, that's cute, but right now I don't feel that. So go through it, though. Keep pushing. Keep grinding. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. Celebrate the small victories. Yeah, but I'm not getting what I want yet. Well, God never promised we would just get what we want. He did say he would supply all of our needs, but not just our wants, because maybe if you get the thing you want, A, you may not be ready for it, and B, it may not be healthy for you or good for you. I jokingly say this, I got, you know, men and women, oh God, I'm just, I'm praying for a husband or I'm praying for a wife. And I'm like, I kind of know you. I don't think that one of those should show up in your life just yet. I don't know if you're ready for that yet. God's got to work out a few things in us first before you're going to get that because you're not going to know how to handle it yet, right? Because we've got to stay committed to growth. But we have to be grateful. There's a story in Luke chapter 17, verse 11. It says this, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go, your faith has healed you. What I want us to see is the Bible talks about it's impossible to please God without faith. He healed 10, only one of them gave glory and was thankful. So the others were cleansed of their leprosy, but the one was completely made whole spiritually. When we have an attitude of thankfulness or, as you've heard, an attitude of gratitude, not only can the miracle happen, but the biggest miracle of all is that our souls will be saved, that we can have some peace in our spirit. When there might be chaos around us, we can have some some peace inside knowing that we're thankful to God. And Jesus showed us that here. Go away. Your faith has made you or has healed you. And I want you to notice something. When we're lacking gratitude and thankfulness, it's noticed by God. Jesus noticed that there was nine that didn't come back. He said, didn't I heal ten? Where's the other nine? I wonder if in our lives sometimes Jesus is saying, hey, where are you? Because that's the human condition. We always forget what people do for us. We always forget what God does for us. You say, well, how do you know? Look at, look at Exodus. He, he, he pulled them out of Egypt. Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and they're down there making a golden calf. 
completely forgetting everything that God's already done for them. It's the human condition that we have to practice thankfulness, practice remembering. Well, if I'm forcing it, is it, is it legit? Yes, because you're making an intentional decision to thank Jesus. You're being intentional. You can't, and I can't put my walk with God on autopilot. You say, well, I've made it a habit. I read the Bible every day. That's incredible because now you're being intentional. Well, I didn't feel like reading it today, but I did it. That's intentional. Some of us may have just gotten a huge win tonight. You didn't feel like coming to church, but you're here. So guess what? Your whole day may have been horrible, but you have a huge win because you said, I'm gonna honor God enough to come into the house of God, the house of prayer night, and get some help. And get in, get in the presence of God and get with other believers and, and just see what God can do. But we have to have that first attitude. I'm thankful for the opportunity to do whatever it may be. You know, there's a story about a Chinese farmer and he and his son, they had a, they had a horse. They had one horse. They loved this horse and it was a great horse. But one day, the pen got left open and the horse ran away. So the son goes to the dad and says, Dad, this is terrible. This horse, we had one and he ran away. This is the worst thing ever, Dad. We don't have a horse now. We can't do our work. We can't do all these things. Dad, we're done. The dad looks at him and just says, maybe. So two days go by. All of a sudden, off in the distance, he sees the horse again. But the horse actually brought 20 stallions with him. And they're all coming back to the stable. And as they're coming back, he gets them all in and he closes the stable. And he's like, Dad, the best thing just happened. What? What? He said he came back and he brought 20 other stallions. We can start an entire thing now. Like, we can do so much more. Dad, isn't this? Oh, it's a miracle. It's amazing. And the dad says, eh, Maybe. So a couple days later, he's trying to break one of the stallions. And as he's doing it, the son, as he's doing it, one of the stallions actually ends up kicking him in the leg and shatters his leg. Dad, this is horrible. Look at these horses. This horse just broke my leg. I can't even walk now. My leg is literally destroyed. Dad, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. The dad looks at him and says, Maybe. A few days later, the country goes to war. And they said that every young man had to enlist in the military, so the generals were going from place to place, getting all these boys and saying, come with us and we're gonna go. So they show up to the farmer's house. And as they go, you know, they're saying, hey, we need your son, he's gotta join. And he said, hey, general, I'm sorry, he, look at him, he, he won't be any use, he can't even walk, his leg is destroyed, he can't go. He said, yeah, you're right, so the general leaves and he goes back into his son. His son says, Dad, isn't that so great? I don't have to go. I don't have to go to the war. I don't have to do all that. And dad looks at him and says, maybe. See, because not everything that we think is good that happens is the best thing, but not everything that's bad that happens is also the worst thing. And if we have an attitude of thankfulness, we understand that in the good and in the bad, we can just say, God, I thank you. We don't have to, just because see, the goal is to limit the highs and lows. Some of us live on an emotional roller coaster, and we've got to get a discipline inside of us that says, I'm not going to live that way any longer. I'm going to take ownership of my feelings instead of letting my feelings own me. And I'm so competitive that I'm like, I get mad when I lose my cool. Right, it's like, wait, what? I get mad at myself. And, and you know where I have to practice this the most? When I'm driving. Because somebody cuts me off and I'm like, hmm, not today, Satan. I mean, I'm, I'm from Albuquerque. They call it the Burke, you know, like Dayton. I think I might have some Albuquerque people in here. <laughs> you can't look at people when you drive there because everyone's like, you know, they want to fight you. I think I've adopted a little bit of that. But when I lose my cool, when someone cuts me off or whatever, I get mad at myself like, Stevie, let's be better. Like, it's not about you right now. Just slow down. It's fine. It's okay. Why? 
because I'm still alive. And yeah, they might have upset me. Because I get it, people are going to upset you. And I'm not trying to say that bad things and people don't do bad things. I had something tragic happen to me when I was a child and uh, it, it, it messed up a lot of my life dealing with what happened to me when I was a kid. And it's hurtful, it's painful. But I had to make a decision at some point that that thing was no longer going to own A, my relationship with God, my relationship with the church, my relationship with others. Because I had trust issues. I didn't trust anybody because of what happened. You say, well, what was it? I I was molested as a kid and nobody knew. And not only that, I wasn't going to talk about this tonight, but I just feel like the Spirit of God is, is, (laughs) I'm just going to share it. But I remember thinking, God, how come you couldn't protect me? I'm supposed to be all protecting. And so I struggled with that. And then not only did I struggle with that, I struggled with the fact that, God, my dad is a pastor, and I've seen them go through hell. I've seen them go through so much junk, people attacking them, people doing things, and they've given their lives to you. So even if not for my own sake, couldn't you have protected their son for their sake because of how much they've given you? So I had issues. I didn't like church. I didn't, I didn't really know if I trusted who God was. I was still like scared of hell, so I was like, I'm gonna just stay on the God side a little bit, but like, <laughs> I had some issues because it wasn't fair. Wow. It ticked me off. And it wasn't until the last several years where I said, God, I don't even know how, who to blame and what to do with this. So I said, God, how'd you let this happen? Anybody ever ask God why? Why, God? I don't understand. The only thing I could really come up with when I asked God was he said, I never promised that things won't happen because I've given people free will, so bad people are going to do bad things. He said, but I did promise I could bring healing if you would give, put your faith in me. And so what he had to do was to heal my heart, to heal the pain and the things that were inside of me because of that. And so when I was younger, I started pastoring at 19. I just turned 36 on Sunday, and so I've been preaching for a long time. But probably the first 10 years of that, I actually hated people. <laughs> I would preach these super encouraging messages, and I'm like, I don't even like these people. <laughs> Is that too real? <laughs> but when I had that moment with God, and I kept saying, I finally said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with being vulnerable about this. And getting some help and trying to figure out because it just, it made me mad. What I realized is that God gave me peace and healed my soul because I went back to him and said, God, I'm not thankful for what happened, but I'm thankful that I still have an opportunity to get better and I have an opportunity to help other people. I have an opportunity to say, hey, I know it was hard. I know it was painful. I know it wasn't fair. You had nothing to do with it. But here's what I also, I felt like God spoke to me. He said, Stevie, there's a call on your life, and the devil knew it, and he was trying to get you before you ever could walk into it. So then I got mad at the devil, and I said, you know what? You ain't about to stop me. I'm going to love God's people. I'm going to love even the people that harmed me, and that was hard for me because I didn't want to love them. I wanted to. I'm not going to say that. Starts with a K, ends with an ill. Them. (laughs) We've been there. I've been there. So I'm not talking about this from a place of someone who's like, oh, you're the preacher's kid that never had anything happen. I was the preacher's kid that something happened to. All the while, my dad is giving his life to everything God's doing. It frustrated me. Caused a lot of insecurity. I wasn't confident in anything I did. And I was preaching and doing all this stuff, but I wasn't confident in it. I I, I was like, God, I'm just doing this because I grew up in church. I grew up in the preacher's home. I wanted Bible trivia all the time. When kids' church would play Bible trivia all the time, my team never lost. Everyone's like, I want to be on Stevie's team. Well, yeah, because I've watched every nest. There were these nest videos of Bible stories. I watched them a million times. I knew all the trivia. But what I didn't know was the healing grace and mercy of Jesus. I knew all, I had the head knowledge. See, because you can read the Bible all day, but if you don't apply it, it's worthless. 
K minus A equals nothing. Knowledge minus action equals nothing. But K plus A equals everything. Knowledge plus action equals everything. Knowledge plus action equals results. And I came across this video in my coaching, and it's a guy named uh, Jocko Willink who talks about, and you, you may have seen it, but I'm going to show it to you. He talks about when something's going on, it kind of goes with the maybe story that I shared. He said we need one word response, no matter what it is, good, bad, something great happens, something bad happens. We look at the problem and we say good. So I want to show you this video real quick. But isn't that how the people of God should be? We should go on the attack. Second mindset is I need to say to myself, the way I write these is in, in an I am. I am aggressive and relentless. So I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to do second elite mindset is I'm aggressive and relentless. When I'm working with the, the pitchers and the hitters at Ohio State or the different athletes and uh, some of the UFC fighters I work with, ah, it's not going my way. Good. It's fine. Why? Because I'm prepared and I'm, for us as people of God, I'm connected to Jesus and he's the ultimate champion. He says, in this life you'll have trials and troubles and tribulations, but take heart for I have overcome the world. He says that we're more than conquerors, that we're overcomers, which means I have to have a default attitude of being aggressive and relentless. I can't be timid. I remember uh, when I first got to play football as a kid, my dad didn't let me play forever because he said, oh, I got all these injuries that I don't want you to get hurt. And I was like, but I want to play, Dad. Like, it looks cool on TV and my, all my friends are playing and I want to play. But he didn't let me play forever because I, I was going to get hurt. So I was stuck playing basketball and I'm not exactly tall or, you know, I'm, I'm a five foot nine white guy. You know, like, I can shoot, you know, I, I can shoot, but that's it. That's why you put the white guy on your team, because he can shoot. <laughs> That's all I got. So I started playing that, and then he finally let me play football. And I remember the first day of practice, you know, everything was cool in the off season to two a days, because we didn't have pads on yet. So it was like, oh, this is fun. We're running routes. We're doing all this stuff. And then it was pad day, first day of hitting. And we did that, the old, it's outlawed now, but the Oklahoma drill, where basically there's one person here, one person there, and then you just... You hammer each other. Well, I'm getting up in line, and at this point, I'm in eighth grade, and there's a, a junior across from me. And, uh, you know, it's kind of big. I'm not that big. I've gained a little weight since then, but I wasn't that big. I remember thinking, okay, he's, coach is going to say, hut, and, you know, I've got to go hit. And I remember I, I probably look like a little fairy just running through there. I don't know. But I remember he says, go, and, I mean, I just got murdered. I'm laid out. My bell's rung, right? Just, you know, I thought the cartoons were real at that point. I'm seeing Tweety Bird, you know? Like, we're just, we're just there. And I remember laying there, and I was like, this is stupid. I don't want to play because my dad kept telling me I was going to get hurt. So he was trying to be, like, protective, but what he actually didn't realize he did is he put fear in me. Because then I got out there, and I thought, oh, I'm going to get hurt. So I, I purpose with my three kids, I actually never tell them, hey, be careful, I just tell them, pay attention. Because see, be careful means there's danger, you get hurt. Pay attention means just pay attention. You're climbing the tree, just pay attention, that's all. Because if you pay attention while you're doing something a little dangerous, you, you might get out of it. But I, I don't want to put fear in them. So I was so afraid, but I remember laying there, and I had a decision. Do I get up or do I quit? And I thought to myself, knowing who my dad is, if I want to quit, he's not going to let me. Because I don't know if you've met my dad, but he's fairly aggressive and relentless. <laughs> he's not exactly a pacifist, okay? <laughs> and I, I decided, okay, well, I'm going to get back in line. And then the next time I go, I'm just going to run as fast as I can and try to actually hit someone. So I got back in line. I, I was still hurt because it was painful. I know we watch it on TV and we don't realize, but it actually hurts when you get hit by somebody else. And I went through and I, I got to deliver a little bit of impact. And then I loved football because I was like, I get to be aggressive and get all that, the rage that I was talking about that happening as a kid. Football was great because I was like, I get to go out there and it's cool if I'm like, I'm going to kill that dude over there. Like, no one's tripping out. <laughs> They're not like, oh my gosh, you, you know. Right. 
But I had to be aggressive because when we're timid, we lose. When we play scared, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. You know, our brains don't process the negative. When I tell all of you right now, hey, here's what I want. Do not think about an elephant. (laughs) Everyone just thought about an elephant. Your brain doesn't process the negative. So when you're playing golf, it's, oh, don't hit it in the water. Well, all your brain's hearing is water. Don't mess this up. Don't do this. Don't do that. We have to be aggressive. We have to be relentless. Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. You don't obtain it by being timid. We don't obtain it by not being aggressive. People have got to have to be aggressive, especially in our society and culture now. That's why I appreciate the stands that my dad takes, that Pastor Luke in this church takes. Because we have to be aggressive and relentless with the world. You see, it looks like the devil's winning, and it's oftentimes because the people of God are not aggressive. The devil only wins if we let him. Jesus already defeated death, hell, and the grave. The people of God have to act like it, though. We have to act like it. He said, everyone who runs competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Again, my feelings don't dictate my actions. I dictate. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Disqualified. We have to be aggressive and relentless. Aggressive in our prayers, aggressive in our actions, aggressive in what we're doing. Aggressively fighting the temptation to complain. Aggressively fighting the urge to quit. But it's hard. Yes, I know. But if you quit, it's only going to create a pattern of quitting. And Jesus didn't die so that we could quit. He died so that we could overcome. I have this saying that I love, that I've been using, I'm saved, but I'm not soft. The people of God, we're saved, but we can't be soft. Jesus was not soft. He was kind, but he wasn't soft. Because if he was soft, he could have never taken the beating. If he was soft, he could have never went to the cross. But he wasn't soft. He didn't die so that we could be soft. aggressive. I'm saved, but I'm not soft. Another way I like to say this is, are you a predator or are you prey? Eyes on the side like to hide. Eyes on the front like to hunt. If you look in the animal kingdom, animals with eyes on the side are the ones that the predators are going to come eat. So I want you to do something for me. When you go home, I want you to look in the mirror and see if your eyes are on the side, if they're on the front. Here's what I know about us. God made us with our eyes on the front. We're supposed to go hunt. We're supposed to be on the aggression. We're supposed to be going, and, and, and the Bible says it's a double-edged sword, right? The one side is to pierce our own hearts. The other side is to fend off the enemy. When he attacks, when things are happening, we've got to go on the attack. Not just the defense, not just the, well, we'll wait and see what happens. But while we sit on our hands and twiddle our thumbs, the devil takes territory. We've got to be aggressive. We've got to be relentless. The third one, and I'll go through these quickly, is this. The third mentality is we have to tell ourselves, I have no fear of losing or making a mistake. See, some of us, some of the pitchers I work with, They're so afraid of making a mistake that when it's time to deliver the pitch, they're not even present. They're not there. They're, they can't execute. The UFC guys that I get to work with, when they get in the cage, they can't be afraid of losing because then they're not going to fight well. They're going to fight scared. They're going to fight timid. They have to go on the attack. They have to go in and say, man, I've trained for this, I've prepared for this, and I'm gonna trust my training in this moment. That's what the people of God have to do. I'm gonna trust my training. All the little battles I've won have prepared me for this big one. 
all the little days that I overcame my feelings and I still got up and went to work when I didn't feel like it. You know, one of the tools and strategies that I like to use for myself is I make my bed every day. Not just because, because actually my personality is like, I don't really need to make it because I'm just going to get back in it later. So I started adopting, it came from a book that I had read, that I make it every day. And the reason that I do, I even made it in my hotel this morning. And I'll make it tomorrow morning even though I'm flying back out. But I make it as a win. We, because I have control of that moment. So no, a lot of the mental game, the things that make us lose our mind are things that are out of our control. We have to learn to control what we can control and let go of the things that we can't. So guess what? When I make my bed in the morning, my whole day could be horrible because people happen, including this person to my own life. But guess what? When I come home, I come home to a made bed and I remind myself, you had one win today. And it was something that was in your control. Because you know the things that make us lose our mind are other people and guess what? You can't control them no matter how hard you try. Parents in the room, we know. No matter how hard you try to control your kids, you cannot. Especially if they're just like you. For my control freaks in the room, you're creating little control freaks. And guess what? They don't want you controlling them. Just like you don't want anyone controlling you. What a concept. <laughs> I'm kind of playing. We have to say, I'm not going to be afraid of losing or making a mistake. Why? Because they're going to happen. Jesus died to help us when we make mistakes. Because that's essentially what sin is. It's a mistake. Sometimes intentional, sometimes not. But it's like in movies, it's a missed take. You know what they do in movies and stuff when the take isn't good? They do another take. See, because God's not the God of a second chance. He's the God of another chance. And he died and rose again to forgive us of those sins and those mistakes and those things and the times that we lose. The Bible says the righteous may fall, but they get back up. You say, well, how do I know if I'm righteous? Do you get back up? That's a sign of righteousness, that I may stumble, I may fall, I may make mistakes, I may sin, but I'm gonna repent and I'm gonna get back up. See, having no fear of losing is all about walking with confidence even if you don't feel it. I'm gonna actually do something fun real quick. I know we kind of got the altar call-ish music going, but we're going to do something fun. So I need, um, I kind of voluntold some people with the help of Pastor Luke. And so I need the campus pastors to come up here real quick. And I need my friend Doug Hunt to come up here real quick. And then I need Angel to come up here real quick. <laughs> if y'all can come up here. They're like, what are we doing? Blame Pastor Luke. Blame Pastor Luke for this. <laughs> I love Angel's just laughing. So here's what we're going to do with them. We're going to have a little fun. So I've been talking about confidence, right? The way I teach confidence is there's three things. I call it your BFS, body language, focus, and self-talk. And so I help athletes and people identify when you're not feeling confident, what's your body language, what's your focus, what's your self-talk. T- typically, when I'm not confident, my, my body language is kind of sinking. I, I might be sweating more. I'm kind of hiding. My focus is, what are other people going to think about me? They think I'm stupid. I don't belong here. I'm not good enough, right? Uh, that's my self-talk as well as my focus. My focus is on myself and how I feel. But when I am confident, my body language is big. My focus is that God put me here to be a blessing to these people, to help them, to do whatever. And my self-talk is, I may not feel good, but God is good. And, and, I, and you got to get the attitude of David that said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are marvelous. I know this full well. Some of you need to go to the mirror when you go home and you say, but I don't feel good about myself. You need to look at yourself and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God, your works are marvelous, and I know that full well. you got to start speaking and acting different than how you feel. So they're going to have to do something right now that is going to require them to act different than how they feel. So I have these sticks right here. They're actually sticks that I'm going to light on fire. And what all five of them are going to do is eat the fire. (laughs) Y'all are like, wait, for real? So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to give each of you one. You're welcome. (laughs) Doug said, I did not volunteer for this. 
I voluntold him. I appreciate you, Doug. So here's how this works. This is a practice in acting different than how you feel. So here's what we're gonna do. Can I borrow yours real quick? You're gonna hold your, your stick. We're gonna dip it in um, some fluid right there, okay? This is, this is great. <laughs> Ash said, just ignore him. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna get big, okay? Big body language, you've gotta get big. This sounds cool. There's gonna be about a one foot flame on this and then all of a sudden you're gonna go, oh, okay. So you gotta get big, right? In order to do something you've never done, in order to act with confidence, you have to get big. Right, they tell you when, when a bear's attacking you or whatever, you gotta try to get big, okay? So you gotta get big. So you're gonna get big, then you're gonna go up here, you're gonna breathe big, and then you're gonna commit big. The key to confidence is big body language, breathe, God gave us breath, it cleanses us, and then you gotta just commit. So you're gonna go from here, okay, I'm gonna light it on fire, and don't take forever because this will heat up if you take forever, so you gotta do it quick, okay? You're gonna go right here, you're gonna, t you're gonna have your head up, you're gonna go here, you're gonna turn it like this, you're gonna go straight into your mouth, and you're gonna close your mouth for four to five seconds. And if you listen to me, everything will be fine. Y'all think they can do it? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. So, so, so I'll, I'll go to you, I'll go to you. So again, big body language, you're gonna get big, you're gonna breathe big, go straight into your mouth. So open wide. I know you got a little facial hair like me. My dad was a firefighter. So this is totally opposite of that. Okay. It's like we put fires out. You're going to do that with your mouth. Uh, so pastors do. We put out fires by speaking the word of God. Oh, that, that just worked out too perfect. So you're going to get big. You're going to breathe big. Go straight into your mouth. Make sure you open wide. Don't, you know, okay. You've got a little facial hair like me. So yeah, you don't want to singe anything, but you'll be fine. So here, <laughs> so here, dip it in there, and then shake it out a few times. There you go, Doug. <laughs> Doug's like, I am never. <laughs> He's upset with me because I beat him at golf today, and I think it was about halfway through the round. I said, Hey, Doug, I need you to, I need you to do something tonight. And his face was like, What? And me and Pastor Luke said, Just trust me. And so I think he was thinking about it. Okay, shake it out a little bit. Okay, so you guys ready? I'm going to go down the line. I'm going to light each of them on fire. Remember, get big, breathe big, put it in your mouth, close your mouth. When it gets in there, close it. We ready? Come on, y'all. Y'all got to bring the juice and cheer for them. Once I light it, go. 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 Straight in. There we go. Y'all awesome. give it up for him. <laughs> Doug, you didn't know you were going to eat fire tonight. Here's the deal. You ate fire, you can do anything. It's a practice in acting different than how you feel. Everything is cool, everything's calm until there's fire. But you know what the people of God do? We don't run from fire, we run to the fire because we have the Spirit of God inside of us who can put out the fires. The world's on fire right now, we've got to run to the fire. We're the firefighters. We're the ones that are aggressive and relentless. We're not afraid of losing or making a mistake or looking stupid. We don't care because Jesus died for all that. We act like, oh, he's so embarrassed by who I am. Like, I think some of us really think when we mess up, God is literally in heaven looking at us going, like, super shocked and going, oh, myself? <laughs> some of y'all are still catching that. He knows. He knows how you are. He knows what you're doing. And he still offers you his grace and his kindness and his mercy and his forgiveness. Last one. Last mindset is I never, ever give up, no matter what it is. I never keep pitching, I never keep fighting, I never keep showing up, I never, keep, keep, I never give up praying, I never give up going to church, I never get, give up my relationship with Jesus, I never give up, no matter what it is. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good. 
for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. It's like Noah, he was building the ark for years. He didn't give up. God saved him and his family. Say, I'm praying for my family. Don't stop. Don't stop inviting your friends to church. Don't stop inviting them to Jesus. Don't ever give up. The only way to lose is to quit. Jesus didn't quit, so we can't quit. We can have moments. We can have our feelings. We can have our, we can be upset. We can do all that. We can be sad. We can have a bad day. Here's a rule I give all my athletes and people I work with. You're allowed one bad day. You just can't have two in a row. So if you were depressed today, you don't get to wake up tomorrow and be depressed. You, you, you choose to act different than how you feel tomorrow. Sorrow may last for the night. Joy comes in the morning. So you better get that joy in the morning. And say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, even though I don't feel like it. Why? Because I'm depressed. Why am I depressed? Because I'm thinking about myself. (laughs) When I'm focused on how I feel, that's when depression and anxieties come. When I'm focused on Jesus and I'm focused on serving and helping others, it gets my mind off of how I feel and gets me to start doing what God created and intended for each of us to do. The cure for depression and anxieties is to just face them. I tell my athletes, make anxiety your friend. You say, well, what do you mean? Instead of trying to fight it, right, the worst thing we can tell ourselves is calm down. I just tell people, reframe it, say, instead of saying I'm nervous or I'm anxious, just say, I'm excited. Because that's a positive emotion. When I was coming up to preach, I was anxious, but it was because I was excited. Because I said, God, you're going to do something for people tonight. And if nothing else, you're going to do something in me as I deliver your word. You're going to do something because the Bible says it's alive and active. The word of God never comes back void. But we've got to be willing to do the mundane and never give up. O-A-D-B, I got to do it on a daily basis. I got to practice these four mindsets on a daily basis. Why? Because again, Matthew 24, 13 says this, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Jesus had these mindsets. Jesus had these mindsets. He was thankful for his opportunity to save humanity even though he was gonna have to go through torture and to where the Bible says you couldn't even tell he was a human being. He was thankful for the opportunity that he could love and show us what love was by giving his life for us. He was aggressive and relentless in his pursuit of you. He didn't sit back and when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and just say, oh, let's passively just wait. They'll figure it out. You know what he knew? We were not gonna figure it out. Because I know a lot of us are like, yo, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Adam and Eve, why'd you do that? And they're going to look right back at you and say, you read our story over and over and you still did what you did. You didn't just eat one piece of fruit, you ate all the pieces of fruit. Like you didn't stop eating from the tree. So he knew we weren't going to figure it out, so he was aggressive and relentless in his pursuit of us. He wasn't afraid of... Losing, he said, no, I'm going to win. He had a moment in the garden. The Bible says he was sweating blood. He felt an emotion. God, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Jesus showed us how to act different than how we feel. He could have ran and could have hid. He could have said, I'm not doing this. They're not worth it. He said, no, they're worth it. He said, everything that I'm about to endure, being betrayed by one of my best friends, being mercilessly beaten, hung on a cross, humiliated, spit on, mocked, I'm going to go through it for them. He never gave up. He saw it all the way through to where he was put in the grave, but thank God he didn't stay there. So he showed us if we just see it all the way through in due season, we will reap a harvest if we don't lose heart, if we don't lose hope. We've got to keep hope alive. If you say, well, preacher, I don't have a lot of hope, Jesus is the ultimate hope. Jesus is the hope that you can spend an eternity in heaven. You can spend eternity 
where the Bible says there is no more pain, there's no more sorrow. It's going to wipe away every tear. That can be your eternal destination. That can be mine if we connect to Jesus. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me real quick, if you're in here. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, this is what Jesus was saying is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I don't know where you're at in your life. But I don't want to miss this opportunity that if you don't know Jesus, that you have an opportunity to give your life to him tonight. So if you're in here or you're watching online or you're watching in Short Creek or at White Mountains and you say, preacher, I don't know Jesus. I've never asked him to be my Lord, to be my Savior. And I need help. I need help with my life and I want to make sure that I'm with God and that my eternal destination is not hell, but it's heaven. So maybe you've never given him your life or maybe you've given him your life before, but you've completely walked away and you say, tonight I need to recommit my life to Jesus. I'm gonna say from this day forward, I'm gonna follow you, Jesus. Or maybe you're just in a place where you say, I, preacher, I don't actually know if I'm right with God or not, but I don't wanna leave tonight without knowing that I'm right with Jesus. So if that's you and you're in one of those three places with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is between you and God. You say, preacher, would you just pray with me that I could give my life to Jesus? I could ask him to be my Lord and Savior right where you're seated. If you would, just raise your hand. I just want to know who I'm praying with. Is there anybody? Thank you, 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 thank you. Wow. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, hands everywhere. Thank you. I see all those hands back there. I see those hands. I see that hand. I see those. I see this hand. If you raised your hand, I'm going to ask that you would do me a favor. I'm going to ask that you would pray this prayer after me aloud so you can hear your own voice. More importantly, I'm going to ask that you'd believe it in your heart. Come straight out of the word of God, Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we'll be saved. For everybody else that's in here or wherever you're at, if you are a follower of Jesus and you're already saved, if you would also repeat this after me in support of those who raised their hand, if everybody would, say, Father, I come to you now seeking salvation. So right now, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is is Lord, that you sent him to die on the cross for my sin, and that you raised him from the grave. So Jesus, I give you my life. I ask that you forgive me of my sin, and that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me and guide me in all your ways, in all your truth, in Jesus' name. I want to say a quick prayer for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Luke. If you would just add it to the prayer just one more time. If, if you're in here and you say, Preacher, I need work on my mindset. I want to, I want to commit my mind to God tonight. I'm not, I don't know your situation. I don't know where you're at, but I'm just going to pray for you. If that's you and you say, you know, maybe I need to start adopting these or there's something in it, and I just I want a, some prayer for that. If, right where you're seated, if you would just raise your hand. If that's you and you say, you know what, God, God, you see these hands. You know their story. You know their heart. You know what's going on in their minds. You know their battles, you know their heartaches. Maybe some of them connected with my story, God, and maybe there's been so, so much hurt and pain that their, their mind and their, they're just angry. God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would just fill them with your peace that surpasses all understanding. God, let them know that you saw what happened. You see the things, you, you see the stuff. You see the stuff that others have done, but you've also seen the stuff that they've done. And that you're just offering them help. God, that they would have an attitude that says, I'm thankful. God, that they would be aggressive and relentless. Maybe they haven't before, but today, from this moment forward, they're gonna be aggressive, they're gonna be relentless. They're not gonna have a fear of losing or what, what are people gonna think? God, we only care what an audience of one thinks, and that's what you want and who you are. That they would never give up. God, give them grit, give them toughness to endure all the way to the end in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.